So thank you all for coming today. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, a longtime uh, friend and colleague. And I've been spending the last decade trying to master his last name. So let me see if I get it right this time. Dr. Vizilek? Yes, but you did. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Um, so um, Dr. Vizilek uh, completed a train, his neurology residency at the University of Nebraska in Omaha and then did a clinical physiology fellowship at uh, the main Mayo, sorry, the main uh, uh, Mayo campus. And then he uh, went, joined the faculty at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville and has been there for the past two decades. Uh, his focus is movement disorders and neurogenetics, and he has an international, he's internationally known in those areas. Uh, he has been the uh, uh, editor-in-chief of Parkinsonism and Related Disorders for a number of years. He's the clinical core director of their Mayo Clinic Jacksonville Udall Center, uh, and he's going to talk to us today about the genetics of Parkinson's disease and other related disorders. So, Thank you, Professor Zabakian, for such wonderful uh, introduction, and also thank you for inviting me. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was invited to come here uh, a year and a half ago, but because of your uh, plans of uh, reapplying for the Udall grant, I postponed this visit. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here, and it's uh, wonderful to have an opportunity to meet old friends. So on the way to to Seattle, I was sitting on the plane for many hours, and I was thinking uh, when uh, we started to collaborate with your faculty. And my very first paper uh, with your faculty, with Dr. Bird, was in 1998. But our collaboration started a, a year or two before that. Since then, we published together about 30 papers on different uh, subjects. Um, with uh, Dr. Bird, I shared 11 publications with Dr. Mata, about seven or eight, with Dr. Zabatian, and uh, other faculties as well. Uh, it's Dr. Sami here, Ali Sami. Uh, he collaborated with me as well, and I believe he's a, a faculty of uh, your institution as well, right? So. Uh, a long, uh, long journey. And more recently, I worked with Dr. Jay Z on his R01 project of LARC2 cases. And for the last four years, with Dr. Zabatian from the Udal grant. So we have a very long history of uh, collaborating with each other. Uh, before we dissect the project, uh, the topic of uh, our lecture today, Mayo Clinic. Medical Industry Relations Committee and Conflict of Interest Review Board wants me to present the slides with disclosures. The most important thing that they want me to tell you is that uh, Mayo Clinic team uh, that I was part of that uh, successfully uh, patented the LARC2 gene discovery and that was uh, licensed by the Mayo Clinic. Uh, and that technology is um, yeah, has been uh, sold out by the clinic, my personal fees from this are less than $200 per year, so I guess my judgment will not be clouded. So my talk today uh, will have um, uh, several points. I will first talk about PD-associated genes, and I showed you some presentations. Then I will uh, talk briefly about some FTDP genes, and I will show you some videos, and then I will uh, summarize a few works that we've done under the current uh, Udall grant. So uh, there are many uh, classification schemes of Parkinson's disease gene. This is one of the first one which classifies uh, Parkinsonian genes by the time of the discovery. And this is a growing uh, list uh, of uh, genes. This classification uh, has a number of drawbacks. Uh, first, of, uh, first of all, it includes loci and also includes the genes. Uh, in which mutations are associated with phenotype that is far from the phenotype seen in classic Parkinson's disease. Nevertheless, it is still useful classification, and over the last year, two more uh, genes have been added to this uh, classification, and they are in blue. 
Now, in the last issue of Movement Disorder Journal, uh, there is a, a new classification proposed by uh, the International Parkinsonism and Movement Disorder Society, a nomenclature of genetic movement disorders put uh, together by Dr. Maras and her colleagues. This uh, classification uh, may be useful, but it's equally complicated. We'll see how this will contribute uh, to uh, this um, uh, nomenclature uh, schemes. In addition to monogenetic forms of uh, in, in addition to monogenetic forms of Parkinson's disease that are classified under uh, uh, parkin, uh, under Park classification that I showed you a moment ago, there are a number of genes uh, that mutation produce phenotype that is undistinguishable for uh, from uh, classic Parkinson's disease. And a good example is SCA2 mutation that we were actually together involved with Dr. Bird. We had a family in Canada that we were hoping that we can discover the new gene. I spent uh, a lot of time going to the Canada, examining the patients there, and then it turned out to be that this, pa uh, this uh, family had SCA2 mutation, classic Parkinson's disease phenotype, no ataxia, no uh, cerebellar atrophy and neuroimaging. Very late in the course, uh, after we uh, discovered the genetic uh, background of this family, some of the family members developed some ataxia and cerebellar atrophy, but uh, when we were interested in this, uh, they had no ataxia. And there's many others uh, that are uh, similar to that. Uh, the Perry syndrome that we studied uh, with uh, at the Mayo Clinic, this is an aggressive form of uh, Parkinson's disease uh, phenotype initially, at least, at least initially, and these patients can die in two years from the onset to death. HDLS is the white matter disease that again we studied together with uh, Dr. Bird. That, his contribution was very valuable uh, for uh, me to be stimulated to work on this family, and that actually led to the discovery of CSF1R gene. Um, so those are the work that I kind of briefly summarized um, here, but I will not talk um, later during my talk. In addition to monogenetic forms of Parkinson's disease are susceptibility genes, and there are many of them, and uh, we work uh, on uh, some of them was done through the GOPD uh, consortium. We had earlier uh, had uh, uh, interesting conversation with Olena. Uh, so one of the projects that she uh, proposes may be ideal for the GOPD, uh, GOPD uh, consortium. And so I actually asked her to talk to you, uh, uh, Cyrus, and maybe explain to her in more detail how the GOPD works, because that would be excellent venue to uh, pursue this uh, type of collaboration. Uh, now, uh, you are in the uh, uh, forefront of uh, great genetic discoveries that have been uh, accomplished uh, here. You are looking for the uh, this risk factors uh, in PD genes and try to uh, collaborate uh, their importance into the uh, dementia, and you had a number of uh, papers that have been published over the years in uh, very uh, high impact factor papers, and you have also done a lot of work on GBA uh, and uh, PD. GBA is considered a risk factor. Uh, for s Some consider that actually a monogenic form with reduced penetrance, uh, but probably that is a high uh, risk factor for Parkinson's disease and any body disease. And another approach is through GWA study. The first one was done by Dr. Maraganore when, when he was at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Um, he uh, did the GWA study on Mayo Clinic samples at, at the time, and he nominated semaphorin 5A gene as a new susceptibility gene for Parkinson's disease since then. Many of these GWA studies were done. Almost all nominated two genes, alpha synuclein and tau genes. There are some that nominated more than one, and both are listed in blue color on the left side. The last um, most significant study in this area was done by uh, Nels and colleagues 
that we contributed and you contributed, I believe, to this one study as well, publishing Nature Genetics, and six additional risk factors were included. One of them is VPS uh, 13C, and I'm going to talk about this in, uh, later on. So uh, we need to start this talk with alpha-synuclein. This was a gene in which uh, A53T mutation was uh, discovered back in 1997. This was done at NIH by Polymeropoulos and colleagues. Since then, as you can see, a number of point mutations have been discovered. A53E is the latest uh, addition uh, to this uh, growing list of alpha-synuclein mutations. Another uh, important discovery took also uh, place um, uh, with the significant collaboration of, uh, with uh, Mayo Clinic, that is discovery of multiplications of alpha-synuclein gene. And that was done initially on the family that was followed by the uh, Mayo Clinic investigators for about 30 years. What is important from the clinical standpoint here that point mutations and duplications of alpha-synuclein gene have pretty much similar phenotypes, similar age of onset on average about 50 years, similar disease duration, and uh, similar clinical pattern. However, in the case of triplications, this is a different situation. The age of onset is younger, 35 years disease duration is shorter and phenotype is much more complex. All cases that came to the autopsy so far showed alpha-synuclein uh, pathology. So this is the kindred on which the alpha-synuclein A53T mutation was uh, uh, first discovered and also on three small uh, Greek uh, kindreds um, back in 1997. Uh, These uh, patients have a relatively younger age of onset, 46 years, disease duration, 9 years, but otherwise uh, the phenotype was um, very classic for uh, typical uh, Parkinson's disease. Interesting, later on we learned that uh, tau uh, can also be uh, present in some of these autopsies. And at the same time when uh, they uh, Dr. Dibusan and Dr. Golby followed the Contusi kindred. We studied uh, the Greek American uh, kindred that we published in 1995 before the alpha synuclein gene was discovered. And later we uh, had uh, different uh, studies done on this kindred. And one of them was on PET studies with uh, Dr. Sami uh, when he was a fellow at the Mayo Clinic, uh, excuse me, at UBC. And he was um, he had opportunity to work on the, on the material that we provided uh, for the PET scan exam, bringing that especially for for him. And this is that kindred uh, that we studied at that time. This uh, is a, a, a proband from uh, this kindred, um, 61 year old uh, female with one year history of Parkinson's disease. I examined her in New Mexico in her home. So one year into the illness, you clearly see uh, features of, um, of uh, Parkinsonism, a slow walking, reduced uh, arm swing, reduced, um, uh, reduced facial expressions. But what is the disturbing of it? She is only one year into the illness and see what's happening. Uh, her postural stability is very significantly impaired. She died with gut, her brain, and she had alpha-synuclein pathology. In this particular kindred, uh, the left side of the pedigree resides in the uh, United States. The right side uh, resides still in Greece, and we were able to examine these patients, collect the blood samples with the collaboration of my former uh, resident and fellow Dr. Uh, Marco Pulo. So uh, this is very important because uh, recently the Greek authors uh, published uh, the paper on their uh, collection of uh, familial and uh, sporadic cases with early onset PD that they defined before age of 50. And they found that in this collection of 115 cases, 15% of these patients had A53T mutation. Uh, and I will return to this in a moment. 
Here is the collection of three cases just to give you a spectrum so you can see in one slide the clinical presentation of this different mutation. So on the left side is the uh, Swedish patient followed by my former fellow uh, Dr. Pushman, 48 year old uh, female with seven year history of Parkinson's disease. Uh, the, uh, she had uh, classic features of Parkinson's disease as you can see, a symmetry. Uh, slowness of movements, rigidity, uh, reduced facial expression, reduced rate of blinking. Um, and she also had a good response to levodopa, which is classic for uh, Parkinsonian uh, phenotype. And she had positive family history. Uh, and also she had a mini myoclonus that you can see uh, later uh, during this video. The second case is also a Swedish case uh, 50, 40 or uh, female with two year history of Parkinson's disease, cognitive dysfunction, uh, no tremor but some orthostatic hypotension, marked executive dysfunction. Her Parkinsonism was responsive to, to levodopa and she also had uh, many uh, myoclonus that you will see in a moment. The third case is 40-year-old male with seven-year history of PD, so an age of onset of 33. And this patient is from that Spellman Minter Iowan kindred. So when I was um, in Mayo Rochester, uh, Manfred Minter asked me if uh, I can go and examine this patient. I was traveling through Iowa seeing some other uh, families uh, unrelated to this family, so I went to this nursing home and examine this patient uh, at age 40, about uh, nine months prior to his demise. Uh, and at that time, he was mute. He was not able to, to communicate, but he still was able to recognize uh, uh, his wife. It was actually uh, heartbreaking to see. Uh, of course, sorry, let me play this. And he also had very pronounced myoclonus, and you can see that startle response that he had. Uh, I personally think that the mini myoclonus, and myoclonus is kind of characteristic, it's not pathognomonic by any stretch of imagination, but characteristic feature of alpha synuclein mutation. So if you have a patient with more or less classic Parkinson's disease, younger age of onset positive families in myoclonus, there may be a high chance that these people have uh, they, they have uh, alpha synuclein mutation. So very sad, uh, very sad case. You see the start to response. I move forward to him a little bit and he uh, started. So take home message for alpha synuclein is that this is extremely rare form of Parkinson's disease. It is autosomal dominant, usually with positive family history. Little chance that you can see these cases except the people from Greece or of Greek origin. As a matter of fact, at the Mayo Clinic about five years ago or so, I had a patient who came from a second opinion from Greece, classic Parkinson's disease, positive family history. We did the genetic testing and we found a 53T mutation. They quickly developed dementia. They have some other non-motor features, autonomic features. Uh, but in general, they have good response uh, to levodopa. Then we'll move to LARC2. LARC2 gene was discovered in 2004 and proved to be a very important discovery from the standpoint of frequency. So that uh, is probably right now the most common genetic form of uh, genetic uh, Parkinson, Parkinson's disease, particularly for two populations, Ashkenazi Jewish and North African Berbers. Uh, clinically, these patients are pretty much undistinguishable from classic Parkinson's disease. The age of onset is variable, but when you look on all of them, it's about 60 years. They respond to levodopa very well. Pathology, on the other hand, is uh, quite complex. In initial kindred that we studied, we had four autopsies. Two of them were alpha synuclein, one tau, and one was nonspecific later to be characterized as TDP43 proteinopathies. 
There is a recent study done by Connie Maras uh, that she collected all the cases uh, of LARC2 uh, gene mutations that came to the autopsy, and about half of them have alpha synuclein pathology, and half of them have uh, LARC2 pathology. And I think you participated in this study as well. Uh, and few had TTP43 uh, proteinopathy. So it's fascinating why this is happening. I have no explanations. I don't think that anybody has an explanation for this uh, happening. There are seven pathogenic mutations. This G2019S mutation is the most common. This is very important from the genetic counseling. Uh, LARC2 gene mutations, not only this one, but others as well have this reduced penetrance, which is age-related. This is uh, one of the curves that we put at the beginning uh, of our work on this back in 2005. This, this curve could be modified, uh, but pretty much it's the same shape. What it does tell you that at age 50, about, there is about 20% chance of having manifesting the disease, but uh, at age 80, that approaches 40%. There are some outliers that you also had here that even in the young, uh, later age of onset, they still do not have symptoms. But of course, they, um, uh, they, uh, they transmit the gene to the next population. This is uh, two um, cases from Norway. Uh, Dr. Osley, also your collaborator, that, um, uh, with whom you collaborate through JC. Uh, and uh, here you see the classic case of G2019S patient, 85-year-old lady with 25-year history of Parkinson's disease. Initial sign was resting tremor. All cardinal signs of Parkinson's disease present. Later, uh, she developed dyskinesias, uh, and then uh, she had surgical intervention uh, with a good response. So this is a actually very encouraging message for LARC2 mutations. There are some exceptions from this, but in general, the prognostication is uh, very encouraging uh, for these uh, patients. And this is the study on that family D that I send many patients uh, here uh, for uh, JC uh, project, uh, and also uh, in collaboration with the University of British Columbia. This is the videos that uh, Dr. Pfeiffer and I uh, did in um, the 1990s, uh, and here the patient seen in a very late stage of LARC2. Actually, these patients died about six and nine months after these videos were taken. So we saw them in the nursing home in, in Nebraska, and here, uh, as you can see, this is an end stage of, of LARC2. Not too many videos of a very late, late stage of uh, LARC2 are available. So can see there is a significant balance troubles. The patient needs support uh, for walking, uh, but he's still able to do that uh, six months before his demise. This lady died nine months before, uh, nine months later, this video was taken. You can see a classic resting tremor uh, and her walking, as you can see, significantly impaired, and she needs, uh, she needs, um, you know, she needs uh, assistance, and her posture and stability is very much uh, impaired. And this is her, her autopsy showing alpha synuclein pathology. Now, this is all very important, uh, and it's important because now we are entering a really a truly translational era. And this compound may uh, be a good example. Uh, this is FDA-approved drug to treatment of primary biliary cirrhosis. Uh, this drug uh, improves mitochondrial functions on fibroblasts obtained from symptomatic and asymptomatic LARC2 G2019S mutation carriers. It also rescues the loss of vision in flies. Uh, so uh, if this works, this is very exciting. Uh, for me, who studied these families for 30 years, now we may have uh, the treatment option available. And so that puts the genetic counseling to the completely different dimension. If this drug or, or some other drug like that exists, we'll be doing the genetic testing very quickly because we may have a good treatment 
for some patients who are mutation carriers and the treatment may not work for others who are not mutation carriers. So if this truly works, this will be very exciting but for clinicians. What's known about the mechanism of action and mitochondrial function now? Well, that's, that's up to, uh, apparently uh, improves the mitochondrial functions in those fibroblast cultures that they obtained. I don't know uh, much details about this, but I'm using this as an example of something that may happen very quickly. So something that Dr. Bird and I have been waiting for a very long time. And I will show you another example for tau, which is also very promising. So for LARC2, uh, take home message is that this is a common gene so far, the most common one, about 1 to 3% for PD cases, uh, for Caucasian population, but much more common for Ashkenazi Jews and uh, North African Berbers. The phenotype is classic Parkinson's disease. They do respond to levodopa and if needed to deep brain stimulation. So we will move to VPS uh, 35. Uh, this gene was discovered in 2011. Penetrance is incomplete, similar to that penetrance that I showed you for uh, LARC2. Uh, initially was described in this uh, Swiss uh, family, and at the same time, uh, independently from, uh, from us, uh, there was a group in Austria uh, who also worked on the kindred uh, from Austria later on, we compared uh, the genetic makeup of these two families because you know, it was reasonable to assume that this is one extended kindred. Since the Swiss uh, kindred comes from the eastern part of Switzerland and the Austrian kindred comes from the western part of Austria, so very close to the border on each side but it turned out to be that there is no um, genetic connection, nor genealogical connection. The age of onset is a bit younger, 52 years old. The people are levodopa responsive, classic features of Parkinson's disease. The D uh, D620N mutation is uh, the most uh, common one. And other groups, and I think your group as well, looked into the, um, this mutation in different population and uh, single patients in different studies were found, um, including the GOPD that actually put the large uh, cohort of, of patients and they found six cases with this mutation. So that is a real finding. We do not know what is the autopsy of this um, particular mutations. There are, not, there are no autopsy as far as I know. Uh, and this is a patient uh, from a Swiss family that is uh, followed by my former fellow uh, Dr. Wider, 60-year-old female with 8-year history of PD, initial sign, right-sided predominant tremor, good response to levodopa and dopamine agonist. Uh, later, she developed fluctuations and uh, dyskinesias and was treated with uh, subthalamic deep brain stimulation with good results. Not too many videos of uh, VPS 35 are around, so this is a unique uh, video. So classic Parkinson's disease phenotype. By with earlier age of onset, so that is significant. So uh, this brings me to very practical uh, thing, and I see a lot of uh, young uh, faces here too. So last year, I have a patient referred uh, to me for the second opinion uh, regarding the possibility of VPS 35 mutation. This was a 30 year old uh, female uh, whose father was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease dementia. She wanted to have children, so uh, she decided to take hand, uh, things into her hand and go online and found the exome sequencing company, commercial company. Uh, they agreed to work with her, they collected blood samples from her and from her father, and two months later, she received the report from them that she is a carrier of VPS 35 Q488R mutation that was labeled in the report as potentially pathogenic. She was first uh, with this report, she went to her primary physician who didn't have anything to say about this. Uh, he referred her to neurologist, um, local neurologist. He 
uh, so didn't know how to interpret the data, and finally sent her to the local university that uh, she uh, was examined, again, neurologically asymptomatic. Uh, she uh, was referred to the genetic clinic in this um, institution, and the genetic counselor confirmed that based on the report from this commercial laboratory, she is a carrier of these mutations and very most likely she will develop Parkinson's disease in due time. So she became very depressed, uh, required treatment with uh, multiple antidepressants, and she was referred to the Mayo Clinic for the second opinion. Uh, so, um, Can you share with us the name of the company? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I don't think that this uh, case is specific for the company. In my practice, I had five other cases that very reputable commercial uh, laboratories provided the genetic testing, either false negative or false positive. So this is not unique to this particular company. And we were able to uh, catch the mistake because, because we had the research sample. And each time that happens, it, I can tell you it's a lot of headache for me. Uh, the first time that it happened, it went up to the CEO of the clinic, uh, and uh, IRB is each time involved. Very complicated process when we catch mistake uh, like false negative or false positive. Here was a little bit different. This was actually misinterpretation of the data or over uh, interpretation of the data, uh, I think. Uh, so, but anyway, going back to, uh, to this uh, lady, uh, what we did, uh, we, uh, for first I called the director of the company. And first he didn't want to talk to me, but um, I, uh, call him again and again, and finally he responded to my phone call. And what happened is that uh, in the report, they said that they have another family with this mutation that uh, they are basing uh, the judgment that it's a pathogenic mutation. So it turned out to be that they didn't have a second opinion, they just a second family, they just had a second sample, and that second sample was from the affected father. So by having two samples from the affected father and unaffected daughter sharing the same variant I showed you a moment ago, they call that pathogenic. So we look into the, uh, our uh, specimens, we have 3,000 specimens or so that we looked. We look into the databases. We didn't find that variant. Um, the variant was not published by any other group in the world. Uh, so maybe that this is a pathogenic variant, but at this point we just not uh, call that this uh, way. So we reassured the patient, and she got much better. She um, she is not requiring right now the um, requiring antidepressant medications, and, and we are following her uh, as well as um, we are uh, observing her father. Uh, so. Um, at this juncture, I could say that VPS 35 D620N mutation is just a single mutation that proved to be pathogenic so far. Um, it's autosomal dominant disease, but very rare uh, uh, and probably is real. We don't have autopsies. We don't know what pathologically these patients are showing. But phenotype is classic Parkinson's disease, and they do respond to levodopa and to DBS. So a few words about the discovery of last year. The group uh, from Japan, Dr. Hattori and his colleagues, uh, found the CH, uh, CHD2 gene uh, based on uh, several families from, from Japan. Uh, age of onset is younger, 56 years. What is of interest here and why I'm bringing that to, to you that uh, Dr. Hattori um, uh, had um, announced uh, during the meeting in Milan IAPRD meeting uh, in December of last year that one of the cases came to the autopsy and it showed alpha classic alpha synuclein pathology. So this is another example of alpha synuclein pathology. So we looked into our collection of patients. Uh, we screened for this uh, particular gene about uh, 3,000, you know, almost 4,000 Caucasian patients, uh, and. Um, so a uh, number of uh, 
uh, of uh, autopsy confirmed Lewy body 610 in large number of controls and we didn't find uh, this particular mutation but we found a nine or R exonic variants in seven patients with PD, uh, six patients with Lewy body disease and in one control. So it may be that uh, some of these mutations will be uh, pathogenic, it uh, remains to be seen. So for sake of completeness, uh, we don't have too many uh, families with autosomal recessive Parkinson's disease, but I would like to bring one, which is PARC2, which is the most common uh, autosomal recessive form of uh, Parkinson's disease. So I will show you this case. This is a Swedish case who came to the Mayo Clinic for the second opinion, and now this patient is followed by my former fellow, Dr. Pushman, 51-year-old female, four-year history of Parkinson's disease, intermittent resting tremor, both right extremities, so asymmetry. Good response to Madopar, which is a European uh, form of, of Cinemet, uh, and uh, she proved to be a carrier of uh, parking compound heterozygote mutation, nice asymmetry, classic Parkinson's disease uh, patients. But usually, again, the young age of onset is very characteristic for, for this. This is the newest uh, discovery uh, that was published by French group. Uh, they uh, had uh, families uh, with VPS uh, 13 C mutation. There was a Turkish and uh, French uh, families, uh, autosomal recessive, early onset Parkinsonism, characterized by a rapid and severe disease uh, progression. Uh, so a kinetic rigid uh, Parkinsonism but some of them also had rest uh, tremor and good response to Imodopa, but the progression is very quick. And they also have Lewy bodies, so this is another form of alpha simucleinopathy, but some cases show also tau pathology, so maybe the story is similar to this one uh, seen in LARC2 case, so remains to be seen how um, common this uh, gene is. So we'll move to uh, atypical Parkinsonism and uh, uh, cases of frontotemporal dementia. There is a huge progress uh, these days. This is a field that is expanding uh, rapidly. As you can see, many genes right now are associated uh, with uh, this condition. Uh, Dr. Rademakers, with whom I work, was just recently awarded Potomkin Award. Uh, at the Mayo Clinic, uh, at the um, ANA meeting in Vancouver for her a contribution to discovery of C9 ORF72. So that's a major uh, discovery for the field of frontotemporal dementia and ALS. So uh, we've been working uh, on uh, tau families um, and uh, together with Dr. Bird dating back to our first publication in 1998 that Dr. Schellenberg was a major uh, geneticist uh, here. Right now there is more than 50 mutations in uh, tau gene. Uh, this is a, a mutation that initially can uh, be associated with phenotype indistinguishable for Parkinson's, from Parkinson's disease, but very quickly the situation uh, changes. Uh, aggressive form of uh, Parkinsonism. Note here uh, the age of these people, 42, 40, 44, uh, three to two years into the illness. All of them died about two years after this picture was taken. So this is uh, American patient, French patient, and Japanese patient sharing the same mutation. As you can see, eye movement abnormalities consistent with PSP. Uh, you can see the spasticity, rigidity, dystonic posturing, and you also uh, see um, impaired balance. Two of them need assistance from other people to stand. And here is a unique compilation of videos of patients with N279K mutation, very early stage of the illness. Uh, then this is the early stage, but the much older individual, the oldest this particular uh, family. And as a matter of fact, I sent some of this from this family for JZ project. Here you see the classic resting tremor uh, at the onset of the illness. Here you see the 
uh, eye movement problems, opening apraxia, uh, very uh, characteristic uh, feature of this uh, mutation. Uh, slow saccades. Uh, here is the Irish patient and you can see the facial expressions, the staring that is also very unique. Uh, and then uh, here dystonic posturing. This is a patient in Montana that I uh, saw at her home, uh, very sad. Uh, all these patients, the videos, they are dead. And so they usually die three to, uh, in, in about two to seven years after the onset of the illness, about survival times about five years. Very horrible disease. So no hope. They do not respond to levodopa or any other medications. What is exciting in this field is developing of pet tracers. There's about four different pets, pet tracers that uh, you can monitor the tau deposition. This is very important. Here, uh, those are the cousins of these people I showed you a moment ago that I sent to Japan, to Chiba University. They have one of these tracers here, and you can see this is a 48-year-old uh, female, uh, six uh, the first symptoms, resting tremor, six months prior to this test, and you can see how much tau is already here. Here is a cousin of that patient, asymptomatic individual, uh, no symptoms, but you can see how much tau this individual already has. So having such a biomarker or similar ones is very important. Why? Because, and this is the second hope that message that I have uh, during my talk, that is this trial that we are also involved, C2N, they have monoclonal antibody trial um, that uh, is uh, targeting patients with PSP, and the trial is going very well, is, uh, the recruitment is uh, completed, uh, the patients tolerate the medicine very well, so uh, this is a phase one study, so we don't know how helpful it is or not, but it doesn't matter. The most important thing is that there are trials like that happening now. And there are many other companies that are using this monoclonal antibody uh, concept uh, for Alzheimer's disease, for uh, alpha-synuclein, that means for Parkinson's disease, and for tau disorders. So this is, again, very exciting time that we are approaching. So uh, I will finish in about three minutes. Few things that we are doing uh, under the Udal grant, um, the current uh, iteration. And um, this, uh, the idea was that we take the autopsy proven case. So up to now, we have case, we have families, we have a bunch of families, we collect blood samples, we collect brains, and eventually we develop, uh, we, we find the gene. Here the idea is different. We start from the brain, and then we uh, test uh, the DNA from this brain, and either it's alpha-synuclein or tau, and then we know what is pathological substrate, and then we test these uh, specimens for known uh, genes, uh, and then if they do not have any of these genes, we go to the family and expand family and expand uh, the, the family and collect additional blood samples as a substrate for possible gene discovery. And uh, that uh, worked for some, mass, uh, some of that uh, cases, albeit I should say that this uh, technically this was very challenging uh, for us to expand the families uh, uh, through this uh, mechanism. Not impossible, but challenging. And here uh, we have uh, three cases uh, that we have a uh, pairs who were autopsied and showed PSP. Uh, and we were able to expand some of these families and the easiest job that we had was actually for the first uh, family that we found a tau gene mutation. And what is interesting, look here, for this pair, the age of onset is 4041. But then we have two other pairs with age of onset much older ones. So we still, we've done exome sequencing on those, uh, and we still have a hard time to find the mutation. But there will be definitely another gene associated with tau pathology 
that is not tau or larp 2 that awaits to be discovered. A similar situation is with CBD. We had a number of families with CBD. We expanded these families. And in some, we found the tau gene mutation. The same applies to pig's disease. Where we found some uh, novel uh, tau gene mutations. But we also have a family like this one. We were actually working with Vancouver doing the PET scanning on this family on unaffected individuals hoping that we can have a laboratory affected individual like we did for LARC2 or TAU or family H I showed you earlier. And so uh, we are successful actually expanding this kindred with number of blood samples so perhaps we find the gene for the CBD. And we have also still large families like this one of mixed phenotype that we have uh, PD with essential tremor with restless leg syndrome. I think Dr. Mata, when he was with us, worked on this uh, family. And we still don't have the pathological, um, uh, we have a pathological data which showed alpha synuclein TDP43, but we still do not have the gene, despite that we've done uh, a lot of uh, genetic experiments. So, in summary of my talk, I can say that. So far, LARC2 G2019S mutation is the most common genetic form of autosomal dominant Parkinson's disease. The second one is alpha synuclein. Uh, it's particularly important for Greek population, so if the patients of Greek origin or, or coming from Greece, that may be worthwhile to check. Parkin is the most common autosomal recessive PD gene of young onset. Commercial genetic testing is available to most uh, of these genes, but I think that it will be obsolete, uh, will be substituted by clinical exome sequencing. There is a number of companies that are providing the commercial testing, uh, and pretty soon it will be substituted by whole genome sequencing. Genetic counseling is essential, but needs to be done carefully. I showed you the example of a genetic counselor that overcalled the uh, finding that provided by the commercial laboratory. And I believe that in the future, uh, the people like me, the first what we'll do, we'll check the genetic makeup. And then, depending on the genetic makeup, we'll, subs uh, we'll treat the patient with compound A that is specific for that particular mutation. And another patient, seeing the next after the first one, will get the compound B. Uh, because this patient has a different genetic uh, makeup. And that will happen. I will not see it, but uh, many of the people here in this audience will see that, that the genetic background, the genetic testing will be equally important as checking the glucose level or cholesterol level. I would like to thank many of my colleagues from the Udall Center at Mayo Clinic Jacksonville, uh, particularly Dr. Dixon, who is our PI, and uh, my clinical colleagues, Dr. Witte and Van Gerpen, and Dr. Rademakers and Ross, who are our current uh, geneticists. And I would like to thank Dr. Montin, Dr. Zabatian, and Dr. Zeng for inviting me here and for their current collaboration under the UDA. So thank you very much for your attention. Any cases so far where there is a evidence of a, a, a patient who has a, a highly penetrant mutation but escapes the phenotype into late in life? Uh, are there any discoveries of suppressor allele somewhere in another locus that's suppressing the expression so far of all these different genes? So the question is, are there any suppressors? So maybe. I uh, would say if there are any good variants, so good genes, yeah. right? That's basically what you are asking. And this is a very interesting question. And as a matter of fact, in LARC2, uh, such variants exist. Uh, that actually, a colleague of mine, Dr. Ross, had a paper in Lancet Neurology um, two years ago that he demonstrated that some variants are protective, not, uh, not risk-causing. So that may uh, very well happen. Uh, there are some studies that I am aware of that target the people who are eight, uh, 100 years 
older, successful aging, and looking for their uh, genetic background. Um, and that will be very exciting to learn about good genes that, uh, that we would all like to have. So that's a very exciting field, but at this point, still at the beginning. Yes? So back to the case that you discussed earlier with the patient, who was an individual who was asymptomatic, had an infected father in the 70s, and the DPS 35 variant. So I think the problem is that part of it's a matter of semantics. When we see something report that says variant unknown significance or potentially pathogenic, we have this education that helps us interpret those information with a grain of salt. But a patient, of course, has none of that. And so depending on the term that you use, you completely change the person's take on it. And I think, you know, genetic counseling years ago um, and still is was a way to, for people to understand the basics of genetics and pure autosomal dominant and pure autosomal recessive diseases. The problem is now that there's such an explosion of, of genes being found, you almost need to be, in some instances, a specialist within a subspecialty of neurogenetics to interpret some of this information. And so I think putting that kind of burden on a genetic counselor is really too much. Uh, it's fine for genes and mutations that are well established, but for in, in a situation like this, I, I think it's too much for them to be able to really accurately interpret that. And I don't think the field is really ready for that next generation of information that we're all being bombarded with. Uh, so the question uh, was actually that was comment more than the question how to deal with the situations, uh, complex uh, situations like the case of BPS 35 that I showed. Uh, and if genetic counselor should be left alone or, uh, or not in uh, interpreting the uh, genetic report provided by the commercial laboratory hired by the patient directly, bypassing physicians. So this is a very uh, complex issue uh, that uh, has many uh, faces to it. Uh, I can tell you what uh, we are doing at the Mayo Clinic, how to cope with this. So uh, we um, have right now the uh, clinical geneticists, not only the counselors, but we have physicians that uh, work with the uh, clinical, uh, with the counselors in interpreting the data. Uh, and that has been very helpful for me personally. Because up to about two years ago, I had to do, I have to be a genetic counselor. If a patient was not from the Mayo Clinic Jacksonville but lives somewhere else, I have to call the genetic counselor, find this genetic counselor, spend two hours on the phone, educated him about the gene. Very time consuming thing. So right now we have a department uh, of individualized medicine that has trained geneticist, uh, physician, uh, has a fellow, and has three counselors. Uh, if I have a very unusual case, uh, I had a case of episodic ataxia, that I had no clue what is this. I referred this patient to them. They collect the blood samples. They found the company that does the uh, uh, testing for them commercially. They interpret this data and send the patient back to me. Yes, this is episodic ataxia type 2. Uh, here, the mutation, known mutation, described uh, by others. Please treat this patient. Great. I liked it very much. This was wonderful. So things like that also happen. And different institutions are having the, I'm sure you have a mechanism of doing the things like that. But not all institutions have such an possibility uh, and uh, so the confusion will consist uh, like this patient was actually referred to me by a very uh, reputable university that was overwhelming for them to to cope with the situation so very complex but yes Cyrus, so there, there was a really interesting case and another piece of it 
is that the original test was done by the patient. It wasn't even ordered by a physician. Uh, and I think that started off on the wrong foot immediately. And it raises the whole specter of things like uh, 23andMe and the availability of genetic testing to the general public without a physician being involved at all. Uh, and there are people who argue very vehemently on both sides of that issue. People who say that should never be done, it's asking for trouble, just like this case. And others say that's terribly paternalistic. And if somebody wants to know their genotype, it's their right to find out. And these two, <laughs> these two kind of philosophies go head to head with each other, and there hasn't been any resolution to that. I was actually just having a conversation like this with one of my colleagues earlier today, uh, and her take on it was she was thinking strongly that genetic testing should only be ordered by people who who are experienced in the interpretation of genetic tests. And they should not be not only not ordered by patients, but they should not even be able to be ordered by general physicians. I don't think that's going to happen in this country. I don't think there's any way to do that. But that, that's, that's how serious the problem can get. But, you know, just to follow up on your discussion, Tom, is uh, many of us feel very strongly that there should be counseling before uh, the test is made in anticipation of, of it and, and make sure that the patient understands what the possibilities are, uh, including false positive, false negative, uh, uncertainty, and so on, to make it clear. So I, I, I come very strongly on wanting it to come from a physician, possibly a genetic counselor. And what a lot of people don't realize is that the American College of Medical Genetics has said that whenever these exomes are done, there are 56 genes that need to be tested and the patients need to know the results of those uh, genetic tests. And the general physician ordering that doesn't even know that that's part of the policy of the, of the laboratory. And, and there are situations where um, the panel is being put together where rather than target sequencing, you do an exome, but you only report out certain genes. So that data is sitting uninterpreted in the lab. So where are you under the same obligation then to look at those other genes and report it out even though you weren't planning to. Yeah, and they say no. The labs say no. Right. So I'm going to try to be the guy in the box with the sign that says the sky is falling. I think the best we can do is to slow the fall of the sky. It's, it's the weight of technology is such that in 10 years or 5 years, people can sequence their genomes and the causes. They can currently go to China to get their genome sequenced. So we may slow the process through regulation and, and recommendations, but, but people will have their genome change. So the that. key is the interpretation. They'll be interpreting them on their own, just like they're Googling things now. Well, so that's, in, ready. that's interpreting in quotes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> or, or misinterpreting. Yeah. I mean, some of these, so, so as an example, some of these reports uh, that, that come out of these companies are difficult for me at first glance to interpret until I really sit there and, and, and really think about it. I can't imagine, I mean, we wouldn't take a series of, you know, Chem 7 and CBC and all these other things and put them in front of a patient and say, here, here you go. So I just, I think it's great that people get information, but when they get misinformation, they're worse off, I believe, than when they started out. Yeah. So, you know, when you have an uncertain pathogenicity, I wonder in the future, uh, you might be able to uh, decide on the basis of uh, cell culture um, and a recent where it, with the culture of a cell type that's relevant in this case dopaminergic neurons it's a recent report of trend not going through induced pluripotent stem cells which people do now and then go to a differentiated cell of various types but direct trans differentiation uh, from a, a diploid fibroblast from a skin biopsy into beating cardiomyocyte with a, a group of small molecular cells Way compound. So maybe someday you'd be able to do that, differentiated dopaminergic neurons, and if you had suitable bioassay for it, 
like that would be the way to go. Would you like to predict how many years off that is? Well, well it's going pretty fast. <laughs> you can do it right now. <laughs> no, I mean, actually, you, you, you. We use like that, yeah. Well, this is fascinating times. We, yeah. we, we, returning back to this case, I was a seven, seventh neurologist who saw her, and for healthy individual. And I can tell you that I've seen a number of cases, probably half a dozen of cases, uh, that uh, had um, genetic testing done for 23andMe. These were patients completely normal. Normal neurological examination, we had no complaints, but we went after 23andMe because they had family member with Parkinson's disease. So they've got a report about the variants and three page report, or maybe longer by now, and they wanted me to interpret that report. That was the entire purpose of neurological visit. They were healthy, they were normal. Please, I want to know what is your take about this. So that was the purpose of neurological visit. So this is happening and will be happening because these reports are not getting simpler, but they are getting more complex every year. So, so 23andMe does work too, is that right? Yeah. They do. They do, but my understanding is they are still only allowed right now to do um, quote-unquote testing for uh, ancestry and things like that. I don't think they're still yeah. allowed back in the clinical uh, genetic testing mm -hmm. market. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're still not doing disease genes. Yeah. No, they're not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. They got permission to do one sample from the computer issue that the FDA, so they're making them do that. And they will also sequence your exome for you, and you can analyze it, quote-unquote, yourself. So this is the future <laughs> of... Of the leaky sieve. The future will be, like I said, the future will be that the physician will order it this because he may have a different therapeutic options depending on the genetic makeup. And that will probably happen. And that would be probably very, very useful. Um, so we'll see how that will go. It will take some time. Yes. My question is probably less interesting than this topic, but uh, I was curious, what was the initial motivation to apply urso deoxycholic acid to um, animal models with Mark II mutation? Well, they were, uh, they were looking for the compounds that are FDA approved. So, so they, they had, compounds. yeah, they were screening, okay. they screened 3,000 compounds, okay. uh, FDA approved, just to, to bring just that to okay. closer, and, and they found this one that potentially can work on the fibroblast cultures and the flies. And so gotcha. they are using right now for the clinical trials. I don't know what are the results and of this trial, but. And so people involved in the research, do they believe that <coughs> urso deoxycholic acid will be unique to large two mutations? Well, they, they are trying to target first the mutation carriers, but, but you know, their hope is that it will be beyond that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It was a great talk. It was fascinating to hear. Yeah. Uh, Genetics of Parkinson's from your perspective, so thank you. Thanks a lot.